Now, there's a lot of facets that we could cover in regard to Lyme disease and psychiatric uh, implications. But what I'm going to focus on tonight is mostly assessment, clinical assessment, how to do assessment. Dr. Bersgano will look at laboratory assessment and then a, a little bit on, on treatment, but mostly assessment. So let me start. Okay. My disclosures. All right. Now to break it down, it's good to break down in different symptoms. So you have an infection, there's an immune reaction as well as other, other pathophysiological processes that, that result in symptoms. So then to, to think of that, to, so it's not, you're not overwhelmed by complexity. We can look at what are the infections, testing for that, what's, what's happening in the immune re, uh, system, and that can have implication on understanding when infections are present, and what are the symptoms. And uh, it's good to evaluate from as many different facets as you can. You get more information and you can be more accurate with diagnosis. Lyme disease in some ways is like a shotgun injury where there's many common denominators, but everyone has it a little bit different where they show it. So it can be dependent on the age when you're infected, what co-infections, um, maybe some variables with ticks, uh, genetic susceptibilities, uh, and what co what are the co-infections? What are your pre-existing infections that maybe are activated by the, the, the infection? One way to break it down in terms of neuropsychiatric problems is let's look at the nervous system in an organized way. So you could have uh, impairments that could be cognitive. That's my dog in the background. I hope he doesn't interrupt. Okay, cognitive, that's a cortex. Vegetative symptoms, which is the brain stem. Emotional functioning, which is the limbic system. And then electrical activity, seizure activity, Cranial nerves, headaches, autonomic nervous system symptoms, spinal cord, nerve root problems, peripheral neuropathy. And uh, when you do an assessment, then it's good to organize it and break it down into each of these categories. So this was a highly cited article I did a few years ago with Dr. Uh, Richard Friedman at, or, and, uh, uh, or Kenneth Friedman, excuse me. And we looked at uh, psychosomatic, somatopsychic, and how does all that fit together? And there's some people get a diagnosis of uh, ABL, anything but Lyme. But when you break it down, these are some of the things that come up all in your head, somatic symptom disorder, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at those each uh, sequentially and looked at uh, you know defining them and looking at the validity of each of those. Now, this is a way to... Look at this. I have a, someone who wants to join me here. Uh, this is a way to look at this, where you, you're looking at a multi-system illness that can have both physical and <laughs> psychiatric symptoms. And um, then, but there's a lot of different facets to this. You can have somatic illness that causes psychiatric distress, psychiatric distress and cause somatic illness, and, uh, but then there's also a lot of medical uncertainty. So what you don't do is say, well, I don't understand this. The test is negative, so it's all in your head. You have to break this down and look at it methodically. And once he gets his um, reading, I think maybe he'll settle down, okay? So the assessment, the standard of care in medicine has always been to do a detailed clinical evaluation. This is something we're taught in medical school and we're, it can take us four hours to do it. We take a thorough history, review of symptoms. We do a, a thorough exam. We break it down methodically. We use clinical judgment and we do pattern recognition. And what pattern best approximates this, the symptoms that we're seeing? And pattern recognition is critical. It's not just, and I think some people are influenced because if you look at, let's say, CDC, the main purpose of CDC is often um, surveillance and epidemiological statistics. So they come from a different angle, but we're clinicians. We're evaluating and treating patients. And that's different than epidemiological uh, issues being the priority. So uh, there are other assessments that have been done. Dr. Boriscano did one uh, 2005, many years, a number of years ago. Uh, and then Dr. Fallon did one recently. These are different types of Lyme clinical assessment 
uh, formats that existed. Uh, I this this another part of it too is being aware of the co-infections. Uh, again, Dr. Bariscano, that included a uh, a co-infection screen, and Dr. Rawls has a co-infection screen. That's on the internet. Now, this is an assessment that we did where I took. Uh, I've had treated thousands of Lyme patients, but I took a hundred patients that no one could argue saying this really isn't Lyme disease. These were clear CDC positive patients that no one could say, well, that's not quite long. And then we looked, what was the pattern and figured out a diagnostic sy system based on that. As a result of that, we had the full assessment, which is really close to 300 items we look at, and then a 24 item and 61 item and, and a screening assessment and a co-infection screen. And that is going to be available on your website. Anybody can download it, and you're free to use that. And I think it's good. It's also good, the full assessment, when you're treating complex multi-system illness to look for what's the pattern. And you could use it for things other than Lyme disease or tick-borne disease. In this uh, study, we looked at four, we had four control groups. So one control group was the patients before they were infected. And another control group was healthy medical students. Another control group was the National Comorbidity Replication Study done by Kester. And then another was chronic people with chronic illnesses other than Lyme disease. And what we found is the baseline number of symptoms that were positive was four before in healthy individuals or four when people with Lyme disease before they were infected. And the average after infection was 82. And people with other chronic illnesses, it was 22. And this is an example where the National Comorbidity Replication Study went around and did a very thorough survey. And they said, what's the prevalence of depression or panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder in the population? And these were the numbers they came up with. And I'm comparing that to the numbers that I found with the patients uh, before they were infected. And you can see the numbers correlated very closely. So that helped to validate the study. Now let's break down different facets. So we can look at cognitive functioning and cognitive functioning can be broken down in four areas, attention, memory, processing, and executive functioning. First, I'll talk about attention. Now, the way this is organized is we, I have the symptoms that are the most common at the top and the least common at the bottom. And then we did the confidence interval, which is a statistical validity. For instance, 7% of the, of the patients said they had an attention span beforehand, before acquiring Lyme. And that's about the prevalence of ADD in the population. Whereas afterwards, 84% had a problem. And when you look at the confidence interval, that's the variability that might exist, that maybe it's more than seven or less, or more than 84 or less, but that's there's quite a separation there. Now, one thing at the bottom that I, I don't have statistics on is sensory flooding. And that's something I've been paying more attention to lately. And that's quite different than attention deficit disorder, because many Lyme patients, they have trouble, they get flooded with stimulation. If there's just too much, it's it's not just distractibility like you see with ADD, it's flooding. It's like, I can't take it all. It's just too much. I can't sort it out. And that can go with hypersensitivity, sound, light, touch, smell that many of these patients experience. Now, memory, particularly working memory is the problem. And that's 78%, uh, for example. And uh, long-term memory stayed more intact. And then breaking it down lower, where you're looking at words, names, numbers, geographical, motor memory, et cetera. Uh, dyslexia problems can be more associated with processing. And we think of that as more of a white matter problem, trouble making the connection. So many Lyme patients have slow processing, like for instance, uh, expressive processing, there's this slowness with fluency of speech or inaccuracy, but also difficulty with receptive processing where it takes longer to um, absorb something coming in. And then again, these uh, different facets of processing, we can go back down to the numbers. I'm not gonna go through each one because if I went through all the details of the assessment, I'd be talking for three hours and I, I'd uh, put everybody to sleep before I got to sleep order, disorders. 
So executive functioning is another area. And executive functioning is the ability to create and sustain goal-directed behavior. So you're producing something, you're doing something. Brain fog was particularly high, 84%, trouble concentrating. And then a couple of things at the bottom, I don't have numbers on intrusive thoughts or time management problem. Many patients with Lyme lose track of time and they used to have good sense of time before they were infect infected. Uh, imagery, the nightmares. Um, you, also, you can get intrusive images that occur, be they aggressive, sexual, otherwise. And uh, that uh, can be quite a problem. Some of these images can be quite horrific, like horror movies. And this is how one of my patients described it. It's like these gory images that come from nowhere or images of doing harm. And she said, they invade the privacy of my mind. Emotional symptoms, uh, low frustration tolerance, 80%, sudden mood swings, anhedonia, that's a big one increasing uh, in increasing suicidal risk where there's diminished capacity for pleasure. Um, then dissociative symptoms like depersonalization, derealization, dissociation. Depersonalization is a feeling like you're there, but you're not there. That can be neurologically based, but it can also be a defense mechanism when someone has a high level of distress where they detach themselves from the pain, the emotional stress that they're feeling. So it could be based on either of those two. Then uh, behavioral symptoms at the top was decreased job performance and, and decreased social function. Now that's a big thing because with all these impairments that people get, their productive capabilities, be they the cognitive, the emotional, the fatigue, um, your productivity is less. And uh, you're not able to achieve at the same level that you could achieve before. Now, some people uh, are very high IQ and they're still achieving, but they're at high IQ to start with, but they're, they're working under an obstacle that wasn't there before. And uh, their level of productivity was less than what it was before. So uh, now also in here is explosive anger that can occur, like marital problems, um, suicidal, uh, 28%, and substance abuse, 12%. And I'll talk more about that. Homicidal, it's only 1%. But when you think of how many people uh, are infected with Lyme, and, and really this study is people that presented to a psychiatrist. So these were maybe selected groups of people that were recognized to have psychiatric symptoms. And maybe, and certainly not everybody that gets Lyme disease has as many psychiatric symptoms as I see because there may be a selection bias of the people in my practice. If, if I were a rheumatologist, uh, maybe the numbers would be skewed differently. But it's, although it's only 1%, I did do a study of homo 50 homicidal Lyme patients and in that study, there were several homicides and uh, it's uh, but a disease that affects so many people that 1% can be significant. And the same with the suicide, uh, 28%. And you, if you look like 1% before, 28% after Lyme, that's significant. This is a study I did on, on suicide and uh, did another one on, on, uh, on aggression, homicide, estimating about uh, 1,200 Lyme-related suicides. I get a lot of calls from uh, people where there are suicides or, or attempts and completed, and it's, it's tragic hearing some of these stories. Um, then substance abuse, which is an area that isn't given enough attention. A lot of people feel lost in the system. Uh, there's a lot of symptoms that cause pain, anxiety, trouble sleeping, and people feel lost in the healthcare system. They medic self-medicate, and then they end up with substance use problems, and some die from overdoses. I've seen quite a few of those and done uh, doing articles on that. Then specific psychiatric uh, syndromes, we can see that. For example, depression is number one. 79% some degree of depression, sometimes mild, sometimes severe, generalized anxiety, panic disorder. What's unique about panic disorder with people with Lyme is these panic attacks last a longer time than panic disorder not related to Lyme disease. 
So when you see panic attacks that go on and on and on, I see that as a red flag for Lyme disease. Social anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress you see, and there's something about the physiology that makes a person more susceptible to it. Uh, bipolar, particularly when it's a person's been infected when they were younger. Fatigue is often the number one complaint. If you do a survey of Lyme patients and say, what's your worst symptom? Fatigue often ends up at the top of the list. And 76%, now if you look at non-restorative sleep, 76% also, there's a strong correlation there. Non-restorative sleep often goes with fatigue. We call it the terrible triad, non-restorative sleep, um, fatigue, and cognitive impairments. And there's a number of different uh, sleep disorders that you see, sometimes full-blown narcolepsy, but uh, it can be other you know, uh, types of sleep disorders. Headaches, there's different kinds of headaches. A more common one is a sensation of pressure inside the head, uh, but you can have complex headaches, um, tension headaches, headaches that where there's nerve entrapment in the neck and they shoot up through the scalp, TMJ headaches, sinus headaches, migraine, cluster headache, thunderclap headache where it's like a jolt, and then some headaches associated with sexual activity or orgasm where it can trigger a migraine headache. But a lot of these headaches can be, uh, uh, there can be more, more than one type of headache with it. It may start as one type, maybe end as a migraine. So you have to look at how they, they interact with each other. Um, and often people get these headaches when there's a drop of barometric pressure. One day when there was a big drop of barometric pressure, three of my Lyme patients had auto accidents on the same day and none of them knew each other, but that caused this confusion. So these are the, the results, the, the screening uh, exam that is basically something that you can do to say, are you at risk for Lyme? So you don't necessarily have to do this two hour exam to start out with, you can do a screening exam and think, is this a possible Lyme patient? And do I have to dig further in, in this for evaluation? So out of the different assessments that I came up with, this is the shortest one, which is 24 highly significant uh, impairments. And it, that can be like a checklist. And another one is the 61 more common things where they occur with the frequency of, in these patients of 50% or more. And this is broken down into attention span issues, memory, memory retrieval, processing, executive functioning, emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms, energy, insomnia, sexual functioning, temperature. Now, another area that I didn't cover is all the different physiological symptoms. I, I didn't cover in my going through it. I stuck more with the psych symptoms, but I also did a review of uh, the cranial nerves, cardiac, GI, your genital and uh, basically a multi-system evaluation because the more, when you have an illness, the more it's multi-system and multi-system, you think the phrase is polymorbidity. Comorbidity is two things. Polymorbidity is multiple morbidity, multiple different problems. The more you have a long list of everything, the more you think it's a multi-system illness, something affecting the entire body. And Lyme is one of those conditions that do that. Not the only one, but it's something you would consider in your differential diagnosis. Then these are the neurological symptoms, the cranial nerves. With cranial nerves, particularly you think of uh, the eighth nerve, the seventh nerve gets more attention with Bell's palsy, but I see more eighth nerve problems, musculoskeletal assessment, GIs, and looking at the pattern, is there a Herxheimer reaction? Then the, you think of the co-infection screen. And I think of it that you think of three conditions, Borrelia, HIV, and COVID. All three are immunosuppressant. And in being immunosuppressant, you see activation of other pathogens that then become problematic. So often then when you have this infection, you may see viruses, uh, Bartonella be, that are there before maybe become activated and more problematic. And um, people could argue, well, may, that may, those aren't tick-borne, but they got activated because the person became immunosuppressed. 
And these are complex interactive infections. The way they interact is very complicated and we don't fully appreciate it. But basically, Ulster, the, the father of medicine, he basically has a lot of quotes where basically you take a thorough history and you listen very carefully to the patient. And if you listen long enough, the patient will give you a diagnosis. And this is critical in being the father of medicine. This is the core of medicine. Do a thorough exam. What's happened now is people are oriented towards computer algorithms and they have their back to the patient doing this check, check, check with these algorithms and they're not doing their they're not sticking with traditional medicine where you have to watch very carefully, listen very carefully, document everything, do a very, very thorough assessment. And um, his point, medicine is learned by the bedside, not in the classroom, okay? So admittedly, you need to know the literature, but you also need to be close to patients. And people that don't treat patients every day, all day long, are at a disadvantage in understanding this. The closer you are to the patients, the better you understand this illness. So now let me touch on treatment. And treatment, um, here, we can break it down in a similar way. We have the infection. So one strategy is treat the infection. Um, another strategy is what's going on in the immune system. Because many people are infected with Lyme disease and don't have any symptoms or much in the way of symptoms. So it's not just the infection, but it's what's going on in the immune system. Uh, hopefully, when you get an infection, you get early inflammation, later adaptive immunity, and you're done. Somehow people, it looks like, never get adaptive immunity to Lyme disease because people keep getting it again and again and again. And instead, they get persistent inflammation because they're not getting adaptive immunity, the immune system is still fighting something and you're not always aware of what the immune system's fighting. And then they may get autoimmunity instead of adaptive immunity. And a lot of the symptoms are immune mediated, but some of the symptoms are mediated by biochemical pathophysiology also. And then you get the symptoms. So it's a vicious cycle. How do these three things feed on each other? but you can intervene in any of these three basic areas by normalizing the functioning immune system, by looking at reducing the infection load or other contributors that may drive the, the pathology and also reducing the symptoms. So even though the symptoms may be the final result, they may be driving disease progression and disease perpetuation. That's often the area that I work in most. And I think Dr. Berscano's talk would look more at the infection and the, and the markers in the immune system that recognize what's going on. And, and one problem, particularly with Lyme, is Lyme is a disease that is immunosuppressant. So there are limits to how reliable immune related testing is for an infection that's immunosuppressant. So certainly if you can do direct testing or it helps. And a lot of the, the testing is standardized towards relatively early disease. I see later disease. In that study I did, the average patient was nine years post-infection. So it's, it's a different thing when you're dealing with these late stage manifestations. So if we look at symptoms, I'll look at that now. So what starts it may be different. And chronic stress, sleep deprivation, and different psych symptoms often play a role in perpetuating and magnifying the severity of, of the, the disease. So if we treat those symptoms, that can have benefit. And when I look at it, I go through my assessment and I say, okay, now that you have 80 symptoms or, or 200 symptoms that some people have, where do we start? Do I give you 80 drugs? Now, might you have 80 different illnesses or do you have one illness that's causing 80 symptoms? Or maybe you have more than one. You may, there may be some other major contributor besides uh, Lyme. And how do they fit together? How And in medical school, we had what was called St. Sebastian diagrams with arrows all over the place. And we think, how does this cause this? So how do you break that up? How does it, it feed and, and where do we start 
So I sit down with a patient and say, if I could help only one symptom, what would we go for? First, second, third. And you strategize, and then you keep rearranging that order. And that has a lot to do with what treatment you sleep, you, what you give for what symptoms. So non-restorative sleep, fatigue, cognitive impairments often are high on the list. Depression, anxiety, depersonalization, mood swings, chronic pain can be high, somatic symptoms, and substance abuse can be up there. So if we think of non-restorative sleep, that's a big one. That can contribute to fatigue, cognitive impairments, emotional liability, pain, endocrine dysfunction, because deep sleep is what cures you and, and helps activate the normal functioning immune system and the normal functioning endocrine system. And um, when you're not getting that deep sleep, then you're more immunocompromised. So in some ways, addressing that is more about like an antibiotic treatment. So normally you jump out of bed in the morning and say, I'm ready to attack the world. I can't wait to get out there and do everything. You may get a slump in the afternoon. If you're in um, equatorial climate, you take a siesta. If you're in England, you have tea and crumpets at four. If you're in America, you have Starbucks. And then you go, and then you go to sleep and you have deep sleep in the beginning of the night, REM sleep, you're ready to go. But a lot of patients I'm dealing with aren't like that. They're more they're half awake, half asleep, 24-7. They lose the amplitude of the circadian rhythm. So this is a breakdown. Do you, is it, are you well rested in the morning? Did you have good quality sleep? And then breaking down, why did you have trouble falling asleep? Why do you have trouble staying asleep? Or is it early morning awakening? And then I sequentially go down and think, what are the things? A lot of times... People say, well, I just can't sleep. No, you never leave it at that. A lot of times the hardest thing is turning off my head, but then what's in your head? Is it is it silent, episodic, random thinking, worry, obsessing, racy thoughts, intrusive thoughts? What is it? And that's maybe what we need to treat. So there is hope. And this is a patient who was before and after. This person took 16 months of intravenous. And the dark areas go with lower functioning in the brain, whereas the lighter areas showed better functioning High, very high functioning before, high, then low functioning when ill, better now. So there is hope for treatment. And thanks for your attention. And uh, um, these dogs aren't interrupting my talk like the last one. So maybe we can now move on to Dr. Barascano, and then we can have some time for Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, uh, for tuning in for this um, broadcast, this, this video. Um, don't you love hearing Dr. Bransfield talk? I mean, that's I can never tire of hearing his lectures because they're just so smart and so useful. Again, this is the um, discussion how the tick-borne diseases can affect the mental health of our patients. And I want to go briefly through some diagnostic points. So as I was saying, there are many different infectious organisms um, and even non-infectious causes of disturbed mental functioning, mental illness, both emotional and physical. Um, but tonight we're going to speak mainly about the tick-borne diseases, the major ones. Um, and let me get started. One of the things I really want to make a big point about, what you're going to see in the literature, the discussion of what's called neuroborreliosis, in other words, Lyme of the central nervous system. But the literature, and this again drives me crazy, the literature says that neuroborreliosis is defined by the presence of antibodies in the spinal fluid, um, intrathecal production of antibody. We in clinical world know that is a very insensitive test. In fact, Dr. Patricia Coyle, who was the head of the MS clinic at SUNY Stoner Brook for many years, in her lectures, she said only 9% of her cases are acute Lyme meningitis, which is when it's the most active Lyme neuroborreliosis there is, only 9% of her patients had a positive test for intrathecal antibody production. On the other hand, we know that after the tick bite, the Borrelia disseminate very quickly, can be found in animal studies as well as in humans within some cases hours to days after the tick bite. So virtually all Lyme disease, certainly all disseminated Lyme disease has to involve the central nervous system because they're distributed by the blood. They don't respect the blood-brain barrier or, or any cellular or vascular barriers. So to define neurological Lyme disease as a positive spinal test for Lyme, I think is so completely wrong. It's really, I'm going to use the medical term today, they really screwed up <laughs> the research of neurologic Lyme disease, and it still goes on today. So let me move on to the next. 
Another thing is neuropathy. Lyme disease affects function of the nerves, both peripherally and centrally. Um, the unmyelinated nerve fibers, which are peripheral and central, they mediate autonomic functions, temperature, burning, pain, itch, and so forth. The myelinated fibers are more quickly transmitting. They transmit the signals of sensory functions, motor, vision, hearing, and so forth. In the world of neurology, there are very coarse methods of measuring these functions. If someone has signs of a peripheral neuropathy, standard treatment, or I'm sorry, standard testing is to do electromyography where they put the wires up and down and they, they test for nerve conduction. Well, the neurologist will tell you that this will miss, at least in Lyme disease, at least half of not two thirds of patients. Likewise, the autonomic nervous system can often be affected by Lyme. It is, when I say Lyme, I'm including the co-infections. But testing such as um, sweating response and tilt table testing is not that very sensitive either. And I'll show you some pictures. On the left, uh, we have a skin biopsy of um, that stains the unmyelinated fibers. The top picture, let's see if I get the mouse to work, here shows a normal biopsy and these little dark dendritic looking things, either the cutaneous nerves. The panel from the bottom is the same type of biopsy from a Lyme patient. The nerve fibers are so markedly decreased in count, it's no surprise that this patient had neuropathy. Dr. Amy Cass went one step further with the help of Dr. Mozignani and Dr. Erickson, and they developed a stain for myelin and axons, and a special kind of microscopy called confocal microscopy, where they're able to demonstrate both in color and by actual measurements of the nodes of RANVA and internodal length, that people with Lyme disease do in fact get neuropathy and myelopathy, and these can be seen in patients who have a completely normal electrodiagnostic exam. Likewise, the sweat gland problem and the skin fiber problem you see on the left side can be found in people who have normal um, autonomic testing by other means. So just like intrathecal production is not a good sign of neuroborreliosis, um, the coarse testing that neurologists have available to them is just not a good measure of neuropathy. And as I said, Lyme is not just Borrelia, it's more than Lyme. This is a slide I've shown many, many times. Um, the Igenics Laboratories studied over 10,000 of their patient samples, and these are the ones that were positive. 37.5% for Babesia, 32 for Lyme Borrelia, 20, almost 28 for relapsing fever Borrelia, Bartonella, and a plasma Ketsia. But most importantly, 40% of their samples were positive for two pathogens, 15% for three, some four and some even five. So when we talk about chronic illness in tick-borne disease patients, we're almost always talking about multiple infections. Another problem when it comes to the diagnostic realm is the kind of testing that most people have, have access to. When I talk about that, I'm talking about the type of tests that are done in laboratories associated with hospitals or big commercial laboratories, the big box labs. Um, because they rely on FDA-approved test kits, the FDA has only approved test kits for Borrelia burgdorferi senso stricto, the old strain B31, which is a tick strain, not a human strain, came from New York State. And when it comes to tick-borne relapsing fever, they only have two, Hermesii and Miyamotoi. On the other hand, look at all the others on this list. On the left side, we are the other forms of Borrelia that we know infect American patients, and there are even more than this. And on, in the middle, we have those uh, other relapsing fever type really that infect um, American patients. And again, if you rely on the big box labs or the hospital labs, they don't even test for these other ones. And you can have a seronegative patient simply because you're testing for the wrong species. So it's very important to use a lab. Agenix, of course, is the one that does all these different tests when you order their tick-borne disease testing. Another very important thing, let me go back. Why do I talk even about relapsing fever? Well, very, very importantly, it turns out relapsing fever infections in this country very often mimic Lyme disease. And here's a study published, 90 patients who met published clinical case definition of chronic Lyme disease were not suspected to have relapsing fever Borrelia. 46 had Borrelia burgdorferi sensolato, the, the species are listed, 56%. I'm sorry, 56 out of 90, more than half had tick-borne relapsing fever and not Lyme Borrelia, and actually eight had both. So the very important conclusion from this and what we see with study after study is if you have somebody you suspect of having Lyme disease and you're going to test them, make sure your testing includes tick-borne relapsing fever as well. 
Now, clinically, diagnosis is always clinical, and these are the key features of Borrelia. Number one, it's multi-system. It's not just going to be a sore knee or Bell's palsy. You're going to have a patient, and again, if you do a good history and a good exam, you're going to find involvement of the musculoskeletal system, neurologic signs and symptoms, general signs and symptoms, maybe some car subtle cardiac involvement. It's multi-system. Next thing, it's migratory. Um, Lyme patients might talk about a sore knee that comes and goes that lasts for a month or two or three. And then they start to have painful knuckles. And maybe that one knee gets better and the other knee starts to hurt. There's no room to lodge a condition that's, that does that. Likewise, migratory neuropathies only come in tick-borne disease in Lyme. And finally, Lyme is cyclic. They call these relapsing fevers for a reason. The Borrelia undergo genetic shifts on a four-week cycle. Relapsing fever Borrelia may be a little bit more a briefer cycle than the four-week, but the point is that if you have your patients keep a clinical diary of their symptoms, you're going to note that they'll have a good week or two and then a worse week or two. And if you have the map out on a calendar, you're going to see this very repetitive pattern. So it's very important to have your patients keep a symptom diary and a calendar. And this could be neuropsychiatric symptoms as well as physical. The other thing that I have my patients do is keep a temperature record because I found that clinically patients with Lyme Borrelia have a low grade fever, 99, 99.4 in the mid afternoon during the time of the uh, mid afternoon SAG. And often in the morning, they're below normal, 96 and a half, 97.0. So that's a key thing to also look for. All Lyme patients need a good thorough physical exam initially and on a regular basis because there always, always are subtle signs. And you know, it used to be said that the most common physical finding in Lyme disease is a normal exam, and I completely disagree with that. And as Dr. Bransfield said, nowadays people sit with their back to the patient, but very important, you have to look at them. What is their appearance? How are they thinking? How's their speech? Is it fluent? Do they have trouble remembering things, saying the wrong word? Are they pale? Do they look ill? You know, are they tired? All these things are important and they're common. Look for rashes, you know, undress the patient, put them in a gown. Look for spots and things that they may not themselves see in the back of their neck, on the, on the behind. Look for skin color. Um, check for orthostatic hypotension. Check their pulse change. Check all the cranial nerves, including gag reflex, corneal reflex. Make sure you check their, check their deep tendon reflexes. They can be absent. They can be decreased, delayed. Brisk, clonus, all these things have implications on nerve function, even thyroid function. I know that people say not everybody with Lyme disease has swollen joints, but I disagree with that also, because if you study every available joint, every accessible joint on a patient at every single visit, um, you're going to get good at picking up subtle things. And almost all the patients that I've seen have thickening of the synovia, especially about the large joints. Um, there may or may not be tenderness or heat, there may or may not be redness, there can be infusions if you know how to look for them. Also check for range of motion. Check not just the joints, but muscles and tendons because some of the non-Borrelia infections have effects on other parts of the body. And we'll get to this later, but for example, Lyme is known to hit the joints. Bartonella is more like tendons with nodules, tender nodules under the tendons. Um, the Rocky Mountain fevers are more involved in the muscles. So these we'll go over in a moment. Check the neck. Lyme patients have nuclear rigidity. You have to check them for meningismus. It might be subtle. And Lyme patients are often cracking their neck. I call it the Lyme shrug. Also, you know, you're not just looking for Lyme. You want to make sure you're doing the rule outs to make sure you're not missing something else or, or misdiagnosing Lyme when something else could be there. So check the lymph glands, check for hepatosplenomegaly, and listen for heart murmurs. Do a good exam. I want to bring up this one, acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans, ACA. This is something that comes from the European literature because it's usually associated with Borrelia afzelii, but some cases of, of, of Guarinia have been reported, and I have seen this in American patients. It starts as a reddened, irritated skin that becomes, over time, quite atrophic to the point where you can see the blood vessels through this tissue paper thin skin, as some erythemas you can see. And importantly, deep to this is a dense neuropathy. And in fact, when you do skin biopsies under this, you'll see what I just showed you in those earlier slides. So... This is something you need to look for. Um, and I show this because it's the chronic rash of chronic Lyme disease. And of course, they say Xelia and Greenii, but I've seen so many cases of this, I think it must also happen with Borrelia burgdorferi as well. When we talk about laboratory testing, there's two basic, basic uh, categories. 
Um, the indirect tests and the direct ones. The indirect tests rely on the body's immune response to the infection. The so-called standard serologists from the big box labs, the IFA, ELIs and Western blot, are known to be insensitive, not that very specific, and they only cover those minimal species that I showed you in that other slide. Um, with this technology, there's a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. And for all these reasons, it's been replaced with the immunoblot. This is something that Igenix developed that's much more sensitive, depending on which study you look, which validation study, which published study, the sensitivity is over 90%, in some cases as high as 99%, and the specificity is likewise over 97%. The other thing which is really very important, it's been designed to detect multiple species and multiple strains of those species. So you do get the broad coverage you need to look for all the subtle infections. Another indirect test which is often done is a T cell response assay. Immunoblots and the other serologic tests rely on B cell function. This relies on T cell function and can be positive in someone who is immune suppressed with a poor B cell response. So it's another tool that we have and all of these indirect tests can be done if a person's on antibiotic therapy. Just wanna show some very important points about the immunoblot, not take too much time on this, but using CDC supplied samples, you know, um, blinded samples, the immunoblot was able to pick up 93% of cases of early Lyme disease. And again, the dogma had been that you can't pick up early Lyme disease with a serology, you have to wait a number of weeks. In fact, doing the old two-tier test, you can find that it was a pickup of 20% for IgM and 0% for IgG, whereas combined immunoblot, 93.3%. Second thing is, it's been said that if you see an IgM appear, on a serology, you know, Lyme patient's got chronic Lyme, it's gotta be a false positive. It's been thought that IgM is a kind of marker of the immune system for an early infection that goes away. Well, that's a textbook example. And as I often say, Lyme did not read the textbook. Um, it's known that the infection will prevent in many patients the epitope change from IgM to IgG. So the IgM persists, it's not effective in clearing the infection and the IgG may not show up. So. In using old-fashioned technology like IFAs, ELISAs, even Western blots, you can see false positive IgMs. But if you look at this one here, the specificity of a late appearing IgM, um, and this was using in-house criteria 99.3% specific and using CDC criteria 100% specific. So in other words, a late appearing IgM is significant with a 99 plus percent um, confidence if you're using an immunoblot. With tick-borne relapsing fever, again, you sh I showed you from that list of different Borrelia out there. Standard testing for the big box labs, only look for two organisms, Hermsia using an old-fashioned IFA, and an ELISA for Miyamoto, which is very poorly crafted ELISA using only one antigen in it. It's like doing a Western blot with one band. On the other hand, the relapsing fever immunoblot was showing a sensitivity of 97% or more and a specificity, again, of over 90%. 99%. And importantly, immunoblots for Lyme Borrelia don't cross-react with those for relapsing fever Borrelia. So if you have both done and both are positive, your patient is co-infected with two different species of Borrelia or two different families of Borrelia. So the other type of testing are the direct tests. Um, one that most people have known about is the PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Unfortunately, in Lyme disease, it's very, very, very insensitive. A um, lot of technical reasons for this with inhibitors in the bloodstream, um, low spirochete load and so forth. Um, it is useful though somewhat for tissue biopsies such as skin and synovial biopsies. What Igenix has done is they've gone from PCR up to culture. Um, here they'll draw blood, have it incubated um, after being processed. And after two weeks, they'll then do a very special PCR on it. And the results that have been published show at least at 10 times and some possibly as much as 100 times higher sensitivity for Lyme than a standard PCR. And this can be done on the spinal fluid. Only thing is that these direct tests really should not be done while someone is on treatment because it decreases the spirochete load. Normally, we recommend you wait four weeks or more since the last treatment before you do the test. Now, I don't recommend you stop medication just to do a test. You got to take care of your patient. But if they're not on treatment or the treatment's been held for whatever reason, that might be a time you can do this. The other test I wanted to mention that's a direct test is a urine antigen capture, which also can be done on the spinal fluid. 
This is very useful when blood draws are not practical or impossible, some with poor venous access, newborns born of mothers who had Lyme disease. These tests are most sensitive when someone is going through a symptom flare because it's the bad time of the month or because of Herxheim reactions or after menses. Um, and this is something that can be done while someone's on treatment. And again, with a Herxheim reaction, often what we would do is intentionally treat the patient, patient for a few days and collect urine on three different days, days two, four, and six, or one, three, five, just to get it um, show a positive. And in this case, you believe the positives and not the negatives. The only limitation, it's not for relapsing fever, Borrelia, just Lyme. So the culture I want to mention once again, because not only is it for Lyme, Borrelia, it's also for relapsing fever, Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and even the Rickettsias can be picked up. It's reported at a genus level, so you are collecting or capturing all the different species that are out there. The specificity is greater than 99%, and again, based on the PCR studies, um, the sensitivity is 10 to 100 times more than a standard PCR. Just know that these cultures all require different media, so Lyme culture may not pick up Babesia. You have to order those tests separately. So for Borrelia, the testing recommendations are to use tests like these immunoblots and cultures that detect the broadest, broadest range of species because that's what's really out there. Um, what's also been found is that not any one test is 100%. I showed you sensitivity of an immunoblot of 97 or more percent in people who make antibodies, but not everybody makes antibodies because of the immune suppression. So it's been found that by combining an indirect test like that, with a direct test like a culture in line really increases the yield. So if you have a patient in whom you really want to firm up the diagnosis, you definitely want to combine different methods, direct and indirect. And again, you have the option to add antigen testing for the urine and T cell response assay, and even biopsies of different tissues. Back to Bartonella, very common in Lyme patients. Over 45 species are known to exist. And the reason you can see from the slide, so many different vectors, you know, biting insects, even now red ants have been shown to do it, needle sticks, um, scratches from animals and bites from animals. Um, it's found worldwide. Um, Arctic Circle is not a barrier to Bartonella. I want to talk about the clinical features that are a little bit different from a Lyme patient. Number one in my mind is that it seems to be an irritant and a, um, um, a, a dysfunctional agent for the central nervous system. When I say irritant, um, you'll see patients who never had problems emotionally before some come down with anxiety, panic attacks, display antisocial behavior and rage attacks. I've seen that, unfortunately, in my practice a number of times. Insomnia, big driver of that because it's like the person's constantly on high doses of caffeine. There can be depression, can be seizures, pseudo seizures, tremors, even hallucinations, schizophrenia, dementia have all been reported. Bartonella can affect any layer of the eye, including the retinal artery and the retinal vein with thrombosis. Here, it's different from Lyme in that it does cause or can cause regional lymphadenopathy. Again, physical exam is important. As I mentioned earlier, it's more not, it's not the joints so much, it's more the connective tissues. What you want to do is run your fingers down the outer thigh of the patient looking for nodules that might be tender. Ask them if they have sore soles, especially in the morning when they first get out of bed pain in the bones, or pain in the joints without, without synovial swelling. Again, do your physical exam. Bartonella is also known for some peculiar skin manifestations that don't happen in Lyme disease. One is a strange stretch mark looking thing they call them Bartonella tracks. I'll show you a, a picture. It's also known to known as Bartonella associated cutaneous, cutaneous lesions, BACL. Also bacillary angiomatosis, I'll show you that. And finally, although Lyme Borrelia can affect the GI tract with gastritis and changes in bowel function, it's much more common with Bartonella. It can mimic very much H. pylori, mesenteric adenitis causing nonspecific mid-abdominal pain and liver changes too. So here's why I talked about the Bartonella tracts on the left. You see, they don't follow skin planes. That's the big tip off. They are not stretch marks. Look at this, look at under the arm. Also they're red. They, they, they seem to be serpiginous. They don't often go straight. This is a person, you can see these are not stretch marks. And this person has the bumps, which are the uh, bacillary angiomatosis, as well as the, uh, the tracts. So this is something you get to, need to get to know about. And again, these are chronic manifestations. Testing. The old big box stores, you can get an IFA, which is old technology. It's been designed to detect only one species out of 45. So it makes no sense. 
immunoblot that's available is not only more sensitive, more specific, it is able to detect multiple species and basically replace the old-fashioned testing. The standard PCR has published sensitivity of only 6%. I mean, that's 94% false negative. So stay away from that. The culture, as I said, by at least a factor of 10 with Bartonella, maybe even higher in terms of increased sensitivity. Another test you need to know about is a fish, a fluorescent in situ hybridization. And that's basically the blood is put on a slide and looked at under the microscope. But instead of using a standard stain, a RNA, um, fluorescent RNA stain is put in. And um, using black light technology, this can pick up um, Borella, Bartonella in even biofilms. It's a very, very sensitive test. And its sensitivity to this is, is hundreds of times better than a standard blood stain smear done at hospitals. Because it's so difficult to detect Bartonella, the testing is not 100% sensitive. Um, they call it a stealth organism for that reason. Um, and because so many different species are potentially infecting the patients and co-infected with more than one Bartonella, you really need to use multiple methods. And this is where you're going to use the immunoblot as an indirect test, plus the fish and culture as a direct test. If there's a B cell functional defect, you're going to add the T cell assay, they call the IgX spot. And it makes sense to do a B cell test even in this case, in other words, an immunoblot, because you want to get a good picture of the immune function. If you have someone with known, let's say, fish positive Bartonella and the B cell response from the immunoblot is, is, is non-reactive, then you know there's a defect in the immune system in, in plain as day. If you add to that the T cell response assay and you find that's defective, then you know you're dealing with a massively immune suppressed patient. Babesia is another one of the big, the big three Bs. It's a parasite, lives within the red cells, and in very heavy infections, it can be extracellular as well. Studies have shown some most common co-infection in Lyme patients. In Long Island, New York, where I practice, it's 67% um, of patients with Lyme are seropositive for Babesia, so it's really very, very common. Now, here are the features that differentiate this from Lyme. Fever, not just 99 degree thing. This can be higher, over 100, 101, even more. Sweats, day sweats or night sweats or both. The headaches and babies are not in the back of the neck like the Lyme and meningismus headache. They're more migraine-like, the throbbing, photophobic type headache. And interestingly, they do respond to migraine medication. So just saying a migraine medication works rules out babies as absolutely not the case. Another very peculiar thing is air hunger. People feel they have to take a breath. They're short of breath doing nothing. They're on, talking on the phone, they have trouble catching their breath. Another can be a, a dry cough for no apparent reason. The fatigue for Babesia is very profound, even more so than from Lyme disease. And if you're co-infected with Lyme and Babesia, it's even, even worse. It's when you find people basically living in bed. Another very strange thing, balance issues. People with Babesiosis often have kind of a tippy off balance feeling. If you ever on a boat for a long boat ride and get off the boat and you're on dry ground and you still kind of feel tippy, that's sort of what this is. It's not vertigo. There's no spinning. It's just a feeling of tippiness. It's been related to cerebral vascular uh, blockage from the, from the Babesia. But there are other symptoms that overlap with Lyme and TBRF, such as, the, you know, again, fatigue, body aches, and so forth. But the ones I mentioned are the differentiating ones. And because it can be transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme, maybe that's why there's such a high concordance rate in these two infections. In, in America, the most common species are Microti and Duncani, but there are others that can be seen and again, if you don't use a laboratory like Hygienics that looks for multiple species, you're going to miss these other ones and have a patient who's very, very sick with no diagnosis. When it gets to testing, again, you can get IFA testing, which is outdated. It doesn't um, measure any more than the one or two species you can order for it. Um, Immunoblot has more sensitivity, broad species coverage, and basically that's the test to do. A stained blood smear done in the hospital, you can find babies in the blood um, down to sensitivity, maybe one per 100 red cells, or maybe a, per every 200 red cells. In other words, about a 1% sensitivity, 1% um, parasite load. With a fish test, which is avail available for Babesia, um, it's at least 100 times. And one article I read is 1,000 times more sensitive than a standard blood smear. And finally, you can definitely get a culture for Babesia. It's very broad in its reach. And in fact, the lab has detected organisms in, in patients that no one ever expected would ever be found because it's such a sensitive test. It's picking up things that no one would ever expect. 
Again, just like Bartonella, Babesia is a very difficult thing to detect. No one test is 100%. It's a complex parasite. So again, we recommend multiple tests together. Immunoblot, fish, and culture. So you're getting an indirect and direct. You can add a T-cell response assay. I'm going to end with the rickettsias. Um, I mentioned them because, you know, the labs are all reporting increased incidence of this. And if you do tick surveys, almost every tick that's looked at has some kind of rickettsia in it. Um, and the important thing is that rickettsial infections can be fatal. Um, acutely, there's a very high fever, knife-like headaches in the eyes. Here it's myalgias, not so much arthralgias, but myalgias in the muscle, big time malaise. Here, low white cells, low platelets, occasionally elevated liver enzymes can differentiate this from Lyme disease. And chronic rickettsiosis is possible. If you have a Lyme patient with ongoing leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and so forth, definitely look into rickettsias. In terms of testing, you can do serologies. Unfortunately, we only have IFAs for this um, and culture. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the government doesn't allow you to specifically test for that, but these have been found on Ehrlichia and anaplasma cultures, so um, they will be picked up, but not um, you can't order them separately. You just have to do the Ehrlichia and anaplasma culture. Quickly, how to optimize testing. Direct tests, looking for the organism, you do the test when the organism pathogen, pathogenemia is expected to be the highest. In other words, early disease before the immune response occurred, um, during disease flares and people who have compri compromised immune system. If someone's on treatment, it's best not to do these types of tests. On the other hand, the indirect tests, the immunoblots, the T-cell tests, so forth, is when the immune response is highest. That's in disseminated diseases, um, and it is okay to do it uh, while someone's on treatment. And again, always try and combine the tests to get the maximum sensitivity. I put these two, here's one and here's another, two little tables here, um, The sorting them out. Lyme is a gradual onset, four-week cycles, multi-system involving the joints, migratory. The headache is at the back of the neck, the Lyme shrug. If there's a fever, it's low grade in the afternoon, but no sweats. If you're on treatment and stop too soon, you'll get sicker over a period of weeks. Bartonella can be a gradual onset, does not cycle up and down. It's a very excitatory to the central nervous system, involves soft tissues and lymph glands, not so much joints. You don't have much of a specific type of headache with Bartonella. If there is a fever, it's usually in the morning. 99 and a half in the morning is a clue to Bartonella. Can be some light sweats, but usually not. If someone's on treatment and stopped too soon, the relapse occurs in a matter of days. It's a more quick moving germ than, than the Borrelia is. So if you have a Lyme patient and you stop the treatment, they come back to the doc, within five days I was sick again. Well, that's not the Lyme, that's some other germ. That's probably Bartonella then. The bees can have an abrupt onset. It might cycle every five to seven days, but here you have that strange off balance, air hunger, cough type of thing, and it makes whatever else you have worse. The headaches here, the migraine-like headaches. If you have a fever and sweats, it can be any time of day and night. It moves slowly also in terms of onset and relapse. Rickettsia is a more of an abrupt acute illness, although it can be chronic. It's more the muscles, not the joints. The headache is not migraine-like. It's like a knife in the eyes. Fevers are day and night constantly, um, and there can be acute sweats. And when it comes to testing, um, you know, the IFA, Eliza, Western blot, their serologies, they unfortunately do one species at a time. They're no longer recommended, false negatives, false positives been replaced with immunoblot for all the reasons I mentioned. The T-cell response assay, turns out they're the most sensitive early, early in the infection in the first month, and again, very late in the infection if the B-cell function has decreased from being so sick. So during its time window, early and late, it's actually a pretty good test. It's not the kind of thing you do routinely for the average Lyme patient, uh, if there is such a thing. PCR is usually good on tissues, um, not so good in the blood or spinal fluid. Here you want to do the culture for that. That's the best direct test. Fish is available for Bartonella and Babesia. It's actually a stain. It's a test we can see the organism itself, all stages of infection, but not so good if you're on treatment. And the urine antigen capture is a great test, um, can be done on treatment. In fact, it's best to be done on treatment when there's a symptom flare. So again, I went quickly, but that's, that's the way I do it. Um, these slides, as you know, will be available over a couple of days. Um, Joe Sullivan from Hygienics had mentioned that. Um, so definitely take time and go through this. Um, just quickly, the non-infectious factors, inflammation, you can do cytokine panels, anti-neuronal antibodies. They call that the Cunningham panel. You do measures of inflammation. You see the list there. Don't forget toxins. 
Lyme patients, in fact, any chronic illness can impair toxin um, release from the body. That's why you see so many Lyme patients with toxic metals, manganese, lead, mercury, aluminum, mycotoxins, insecticides, glyphosate, other organic chemicals. So that's the non-infectious part of it. So major factor of the tick-borne diseases in the cognitive world, um, they represent a potential treatable cause of a psychiatric patient. So this diagnosis mu must not be missed. You don't want some to have a lifetime of psychiatric disease when it could have been could have been cleared up. So learn about these tests, learn about the clinical signs and symptoms, and take advantage of the resources that we have available for you all. And I managed to do it. Given that patients have limited financial resources, would you first screen with the Igenix TBD6 or the CEPCR? TBD6, just FYI, is our most comprehensive panel. It includes fish, immunoblots, uh, PCR testing, and IFAs for all the co-infections. But they're both very expensive panels. So, Dr. Berskano, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, you know what? Um, I like to target the testing to the patient. I mean, that makes sense. If you have an early, early patient, you want to do a simple test like an immunoblot that picks people up, people's illness up early. If it's a chronic, chronic patient with immune dysfunction, you'll do a direct test like a PCR. I'm sorry, like a culture, which is a CEPCR. Um, the immunoblots are really very good with Bartonella uh, and Babesia. So if you have a patient, go through the clinical signs and symptoms look for what you think is a prompt predominant infection. And if it's someone with very bad air hunger and these terrible migraine headaches and night sweats, do the Babesia testing. If it's someone whose joints are bad and they're having a lot of brain fog and fatigue and they're just cognitive issues, but they're not really having air, air hunger or strange rashes, then you just focus on Lyme. So do the clinical assessment first and that will help guide you with the testing. And that's why I put those tables at the end to help you figure that out. Excellent. Um, here's one maybe for Dr. Bransfield. How quickly do you see psychiatric manifestations to resolve with antibiotic treatment compared to rheumatologic or neurologic symptoms? I think they normally take much longer. And uh, they also take longer to develop because if you look at the course of infection, it may start out, you get the joint problems earlier, brain fog, of some fatigue early, but a lot of the psych symptoms, uh, they may take years. Now, occasionally they rapidly develop in some people that progress rapidly. So it may take years for them to develop. Now, when you treat it, then you have to watch out. You often want to give some of the symptomatic treatments because then when you treat with the antibiotics, you may get a worsening of those psych symptoms from the Herxheimer reaction. And you want to be careful because the worsening uh, Herxheimer reaction could be suicidal, could be violence, and it could be something quite severe. So you have to be able to back off if that happens because you don't want to make someone worse and you want to caution someone about that. But if they're medicated with the psych meds, then they can tolerate that better. And it, it can take quite a long time. It can take months. So it's usually a a longer course of treatment to make headway with the psych treatments. It Excellent. can take years in some patients. Two, two, two other, other resources I want to draw attention to. One is we did a recent journal article, Microbes and Mental Illness, Past, Present, and Future. And that covers uh, all infections associated with psychiatric symptoms. It, it was a very extensive article, and it does go in depth in, in Lyme disease. The other is an international clinical perspective of Lyme disease, and that's on YouTube. And I, we interviewed four doctors from different countries to give their opinion. And particularly part two looked at assessment. It looked at a clinical assessment, lab assessment, many of the things we're talking about here. But it was experts who treated, like Dr. Barascano, have treated thousands of Lyme patients. And that's who you turn to for opinion people that have experience of treating these diseases for decades with thousands of patients. And uh, we ask a lot of the challenging questions to these people. And uh, it's an interesting uh, discussion that we had. So both of those resources would be useful for people to look up. Excellent. Um, maybe just a couple more. 
I have been instructed to do provocative treatment for 30 days prior to testing. I hear you say not to test. You have taken treatment. Um, any comments on that, Dr. Briscano? Well, I'll tell you what that comes from. There are a number of people who have advanced tick-borne diseases, let's talk about Lyme, for example, who are seronegative. Um, why is that? Well, several different things. One reason could be that their immune system is so suppressed that they just don't make antibodies. That's not that common, but it does happen. But more commonly, it's because there's so many organisms, you have a state of what's called antigen excess. Antibodies attached to the antigens and form immune complexes. And the serologic tests that we do, immunoblots, IFAs, ELISAs, Western blots, they only detect free antibody, not antibodies that are bound in these immune complexes. So if you have someone who is seronegative for that reason, and you put them on antibiotics, what happens is the germ load goes down. So they start to free up free antibody um, at the same time as they start to improve um, the immune system and does some healing. And I had seen that a number of times in my practice where someone who was seronegative, diagnosed on clinical grounds and treated anyway, Lo and behold, they turned out being seropositive later on. And statistically, after enough treatment to get the person to start to feel better, maybe a matter of six weeks, maybe a matter of several months, you have a 37% chance of going from seronegative to seropositive. So when you're talking about serologies, again, immunoblots, Western blots, and so forth, um, if someone is seronegative and you're convinced of the diagnosis enough to the point of treating them, it doesn't hurt six weeks, two months, three months down the line to repeat the serologies to see if they have started to develop a positivity. Likewise, on immunoblot, one or two bands can become five or 10 bands. I mean, it shows an expansion of the, of the antibodies that are free and able to be detected. Now, if someone has ongoing infection, you have them on treatment chronically, and they're finally getting better and better and better, and when they finally get well, over time, the antibody response will go away. So it does make sense to do serial immune testing using immunoblots, for example, because in the beginning you see if they have a low degree of reactivity because they have a lot of a lot of germ load, and over time they become strongly positive as their immune system is healing, the germs are going away, and over further time the, the numbers start to go down again and become negative, then you know that the person's been successfully treated. So there is a reason to do serologic testing on a regular basis.